Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for the very nice introduction. I think I can go. Uh, can you all? I hope you all hear me well and see the screen well. Uh, yeah, yes. Can. Thank you. Perfect. So, uh, as I've been uh, asked to give a presentation uh, uh, for a very general audience, not just of experts, I, I thought that I will uh, begin with a general motivation and inspiration about quantum computing, and then uh, I will uh, say something um, a little bit more um, related to research, and I will conclude again because it has been asked uh, to telling something about what was my career path that led me uh, to, to this choice. So the title is how quantum computing will change the world and now it will not. And uh, I, I will be happy to uh, answer to question after that. And let's see if this works. My clicker does not work. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, sorry, I don't understand what is happening to my uh, apparently, I am not able to change the slides for some reasons. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm able now. <laughs> so, what we are talking about, and the first thing that I would like to talk to you about is, uh, if you're not an expert of quantum physics, what we are trying to do is to make the invisible visible. Because the world of quantum physics is a world of microscopic particles, and which has many laws and many features which are not common to our everyday life and intuition. Indeed, there are things whose very nature is not to be seen. When we see them, they are no longer there. We can only see the traces of their passage and near the echoes of their sound. This is what we are talking about when we are talking about quantum particles. It makes us very much question our assumption of what reality is. These are things and behaviors that confound us, they fascinate us, they make us question the very logic we use every day to solve every problem and challenge of our everyday life. What does it mean for a microscopic particle like an electron to be? To better understand this, I want to show you an animation of uh, individual uh, electrons created at a source, arriving till a screen with two slits and then impinging to a photographic plate, where they are absorbed, leaving a trace of their position. But where is the electron before it reaches the photographic plate? And does it pass through the right or through the left slit? The truth is that we cannot really talk about the position of the electron before reaching the plate. We can only talk about its probability of being somewhere. And it turns out that it passes through both the right and the left slit at the same time, interfering with itself like a wave. But beware what you see in this animation before reaching the, the, the plate. It's just the amplitude of, of, of the um, position of the electron, not the position itself. We can only talk about the position after actually the electron has been destroyed, so after a measurement has been performed. And this is something that is uh, we can we can even see in experiments. So this is an experiment where we see individual electrons arriving one by one at a photographic plate after passing through both slits at the same time and forming an interference pattern. This alternating pattern or lighter and darker spots is what reveals the electron's beautiful elusiveness of being in any other form than in its potential form. Quantum physics, therefore, forces us to be open-minded and to think outside the box differently from what we think in our everyday life. And I want to uh, now share with you, I hope that you will hear uh, the audio. I will try to maximize the, the, the audio, but I want to share with you a very short uh, interview uh, piece of uh, Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, uh, in which he talks about uh, a certain class of physicists, how physicists tried at a point to interpret the behavior of microscopic particle in terms of more ordinary mundane particle. Let's listen to what he says. There's still a school of thought that cannot believe that the atomic behavior is so different 
than large-scale behavior. I think that's a deep prejudice. It's a prejudice from being so used to large-scale behavior. And they're always seeking to find, to waiting for the day that we discover that underneath the quantum mechanic, there's some mundane, ordinary balls hitting or particles moving and so on. I think they're going to be defeated. I think nature's imagination is so much greater than man's, she's never going to let us relax. This is a sentence I want to read again with you. Nature's imagination is so much greater than man's, she's never going to let us relax. I think this is really an important message, message to bring home, to learn from nature, to know that we will always be learning from nature. And this is an important message because I believe that in order to solve the most urgent challenges, which humanity is nowadays facing, actually in order for our species to survive, we will need to learn from nature. And nature is in its very essence quantum mechanica. In the words of Nobel laureate Anthony Leggett, quantum mechanics is very much more than just a theory. It's a completely new way of looking at the world involving a change in paradigm, perhaps more radical than any other in the history of human thought. What makes quantum physics so radically different is also what makes it extremely difficult to predict and to simulate. We know that in order to fully describe a quantum complex object, but even a small molecule like coffee or water or penicillin, it's very hard. And the reason of this is that it requires the full quantum mechanical description, requires an amount of information which is much larger than what is needed to describe macroscopic objects in our everyday life. For example, in Finland, we have recently a new supercomputer. It's called Lumi. It is one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. Uh, it is located in, uh, in, in, uh, in Finland, as I say, and it's planned to be deployed this year. It costed over 200 million euros, and it has a storage capacity of 10 to the 17 bytes. Now, if we would like to simulate in an exact way the behavior of a molecule like penicillin, we would need 10 to the 83 bytes. So Lumi wouldn't have even a trillionth of a trillion fraction of memory to store this data. And indeed, neither would the whole universe, since this number is larger than the estimated numbers of atoms in the universe. We are reaching therefore a fundamental limitation and well, if we make and use quantum version of bits and bytes, then a quantum computer only 36 quantum bytes. Now, why is this important? Because the way in which science and technology works is by building mathematical and physical models in order to describe experimental observations. We then use those models to create new technologies like airplanes, cars, mobile phones, and also at the same time to advance sciences, for example, by creating new medicines. But as the uh, technological development advances, we will always need faster and more accurate simulations of the world around us. For example, to describe in a very accurate way how a protein works, we will need to describe it at a molecular level, and hence having even a quantum mechanical description, which includes the interaction with its environment. Now, this is currently the bottleneck of computational chemistry and of the whole drug development industry. But this is also what makes things more interesting for quantum physicists. In the words of Richard Feynman again, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. So what is the message here? What does learning from nature mean? It means that we are using, we have to learn to use quantum computers to make quantum simulators of the worlds around us. Because 
nature is essentially a quantum, quantum, when we want to describe it at a quantum level. And this, this is something that now we have the technology uh, to, to implement, but it is something that not terribly long ago was considered absolutely crazy. I love citing this, this uh, uh, sentence by uh, Erwin Schrödinger, who in 1952 said, that we never experiment with just one atom. In thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we do, and this invariably entails ridiculous consequences. Now, what I'm showing you next is an atomic pot de trois. The dense of three atoms manipulated by computer-controlled laser signals. So not only we are able to experiment with single atoms, but even to choreograph their collective behavior. And this is what is really at the heart of quantum computing, the ability to manipulate individual atoms and building quantum computers atom by atom. This unlocks new modalities of computation. As we saw in the double slit experiment, the microscopic particles can interfere with themselves and we can choreograph this interference to compute and to create quantum algorithms that calculate things in a different way compared to the classical ones, choreographing interference of quantum bits that are the quantum analog of, of classical bits. This in turn uh, unlocks uh, new modalities uh, of, of, of make the impossible possible. Now, what is uh, so this is what the quantum technology revolution is about. In the previous century, or actually in this century, it's like we have been learning a new language, which is the physics of quantum theory and the mathematics of quantum theory. And now we are starting to compose poems and novels using this language because we can manipulate individual constituents of nature. This makes the impossible possible. I, I, in this slide, I show you the IBM Q experience quantum computers. Um, many of the uh, quantum, um, uh, quantum computers from IBM are available for free to use on the cloud, and they allow to perform quantum simulations, even if for very simple prototype, proto, prototypes of, of, of um, uh, systems. Uh, this, this slide shows you uh, the scaling of the IBM quantum technology as an example, and it shows you also how already between 2021 and 2022, they are planning to deploy uh, uh, quantum, uh, quantum uh, computers or small scale quantum device, devices with a number of qubits that will be comparable to what is necessary to simulate um, uh, the penicillin molecule. Please note that here at 296 qubits, so quantum bits, uh, is, is, uh, is quantum bits, while before I used bytes. That's the difference between the 36 and the 296. But of course, they're the same, um, the same thing. So and soon we will be able to reach this precision and therefore to do useful quantum simulations uh, of uh, objects uh, um, that, that are um, important uh, for, for uh, practical applications. Uh, at this point, what I would like to do is to very briefly uh, tell you the main lines uh, of one experimental result that we have recently obtained uh, with an IBM Q experience um, computer freely available. Uh, this is related to a paper. I will be very, since I, ha I have to be very general, uh, I will be only giving some main ideas. My aim will be to give the main idea of what you can do. Uh, and uh, in particular, this uh, example refers to uh, the paper that you see here cited that, that was uh, published in uh, um, Nature Physics Journal of Quantum Information in 2020. Uh, and it's called IBM uh, Q Experience as a versatile experimental testbed for simulating open quantum systems. So what is the idea behind this paper uh, is to use a quantum simulator, so a small device, a small quantum computer is a quantum simulator, and in particular, uh, the quantum, what we want to simulate is an open quantum system. What is an open quantum system? Well, it's a quantum system which interacts with its environment and therefore is subjected to noise. The reason why it's important to simulate open quantum system is 
exactly because they are um, they allow us to understand the origin of noise induced by the environment, which in turn is a limiting factor for all uh, quantum technologies. Now, in particular, we used in this experiment, uh, we used uh, uh, two types of devices, uh, five qubit devices and 14 qubit devices. Some of those are not uh, available anymore because uh, in the IBM free devices, they are always um, updating them. So some of these are not currently anymore available, uh, but they have different topologies. And what you see here is, um, I, I hope you can see my, my pointer. But anyway, you, you can see that this number one, two, three, four, zero, this is the lettering um, that, that is uh, uh, indicating the position of the individual qubits uh, and the connections uh, that you see, these links between them, uh, identify uh, when you can perform uh, physical operations um, or quantum gates between them. And this is actually a schematic of how they look like. They use uh, superconducting quantum uh, devices uh, so it's a technology that requires um, the, the um, chips to be very, very cold. So they, uh, that's why they are inside uh, cryostat. Uh, and, and this is uh, um, then eventually the, control, the computers that control them allow to send them operations. Now, uh, how about, uh, what can we say about quantum, uh, quantum information processing? Uh, how does it look like? Well, this is uh, similar initially to classical information processing. The only difference is that you have uh, quantum carriers of information. They could be individual atoms or individual electrons or individual photons. So you have an input and these lines here are the different qubits uh, of the in, in input. So you would have different carriers of informa information that for simplicity we will assume are, um, are uh, encoding. So they are physical realization of a quantum bit, the analog of a classical bit of information, but in the quantum realm. Um, and, and so you have a, a line of, uh, of uh, qubits as input and a line of qubits as output. And inside, there is a number of operations that the small scale quantum devices are performing. Specifically, uh, what, what we can uh, enter, if we would enter into the operation, um, let's say, of, of quantum computers, uh, we would have um, uh, we would have to look at quantum circuits. So what you see here is the indication of the quantum states of different qubits, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So this is a five qubit device, as I said before. And with this uh, notation, we indicate the, the state of the qubit, that is 0 or 1, as qubits can be in 0, 1, or a superposition of 0 and 1 or any superposition, of course. And then we indicate uh, logic gates uh, in, in this manner. So um, this is, um, you, you keep adding different logic gates uh, to form eventually uh, quantum circuits. And this is just for now, I don't want to go into the details of uh, what this means, but I just want to give you an idea uh, of, of, uh, of the quantum circuits. So you operate on each qubit, making unitary transformations, and at the end of these operations, you perform measurements. This is very important because uh, it is important to notice that while the evolution inside this, this quantum computer is generally unitary or is supposed to be unitary in absence of noise uh, at the moment of uh, you always not only have inputs but you always have outputs so you have to read out uh, the, uh, the quantum computers and this requires measurements on each of the qubit and then you will uh, save uh, these results of the measurements in a classical register that here is indicated with c0 c1 and so on and so forth so these are the key ingredients. So quantum register and classical register. The quantum register of qubits is the input and the classical register is the output. And then you have two qubit gates or single qubit gates. So operations performed on the qubits to manipulate information. Measurement, as I said, is another key ingredient. So of course, it's important when you make a real experiment to characterize the quantum device. And this is something that you obtain automatically from the 
um, from the IBM Q devices. They uh, every day are calibrated, so they uh, give you all the necessary information to fully characterize your experiment. Um, and a little bit more detail, um, we are using, uh, or everyone who is using quantum computers are using, uh, um, generally manipulate them or create the, the, the codes by uh, using uh, a version of, uh, um, of a language that is known as Qiskit, which uses uh, IBM's Python, it's, a, it's an IBM's Python based language. Uh, each circuit is run many times to accumulate statistics, so we run uh, them in particular for 8192 shots, this is uh, fixed by the machines itself, and it requires, this is just because we need to gather statistics from the measurements. Uh, and then what is possible to do is, or, or we are doing, is one and two qubit full state tomography. This is the characterization of the complete state of the uh, qubit, of the single and two qubit um, state. And this is also a tool that is provided by Qiskit. And then you can do a series of post-processing, error mitigation, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, the idea we had is to uh, simulate some what you can consider as toy models, paradigmatic models of open quantum systems. And um, of course, we want to do it for uh, single and two qubits, uh, different types of open quantum system characterized as Markovian and non-Markovian. So we want to engineer in one uh, device, which is a, a, the simulator of IBM, we want to engineer a number, a variety of possible channels, exactly because our aim will be to show the versatility of the IBM Q experience quantum computer uh, to simulate, uh, to simulate uh, uh, quantum devices. Uh, and uh, um, what we try doing is uh, reservoir engineering, quantum thermodynamics application, quantum communication. So there is a lot of results that I will not discuss here because of the time, uh, but they are in the paper. Uh, and for here, I would like to uh, quickly skip to the results, okay? Um, in particular, uh, just, uh, just to understand um, what we are doing, the less uh, exactly. So I want to discuss uh, just just these two results. Okay. So the two results are um, are the generation uh, of a channel which simulates an open quantum system with the goal to create a, a, a maximally entangled state uh, of this form. So the idea is to use open quantum system in order to generate a specific uh, non-classical uh, quantum state. And what we do uh, is, uh, um, what you see here, uh, are experimental data uh, showing the overlap between the state that we generate uh, and the four Bell states. So as a goal, what we are trying to do is to generate the state psi minus, okay, which is uh, this uh, what you will see here uh, as the little red triangle, um, and for different values of the uh, of the parameters that we can control and change in the experiment. And so when this overlap is one, then it means that we have succeeded in generating, um, in simulating an open quantum system, we generate as a target uh, this entangled state. Uh, and basically, as you can see here, uh, the, the, you, you, see, you will see here uh, basically um, six plots. Now, uh, the full channel that we simulate is uh, the C column, so here, okay? And you see that the difference between uh, these first results and the second one, so the upper one and the bottom one, is that in the first one, we only achieve zero point, actually a fidelity of almost uh, 80%, so greater than uh, 0 0.8 overlap. But when we redid the experiments four months after, just to reply to the uh, ref uh, referee response, uh, they were improved. So the machines were so much improved and the noise was so much reduced that we already obtained uh, an almost 100% fidelity. So actually our simulation was much improvement, uh, improved due to the improvement that were done on the machine itself. So the message here is simply that it is possible to use as quantum simulators the devices that are already available uh, um, for free on the cloud. Um, for example, um, the, the, the quantum, uh, the quantum uh, IBM Q experience devices. So in a way, what we are doing here is that these machines are freely available to everyone to use. So basically what you can do is to run an experiment from your home or from your office if you want on the cloud. And this means that we are able to 
really contribute to science more and more and to open up uh, to the contribution of citizens even um, through uh, online education. And I will talk about online education uh, also in a moment. So for now, what I would like to stress is that the ability to use quantum computers to simulate nature at the quantum level gives us or will give us the possibility truly to create a new world. And what I'm talking about is the implications that this can have. I show you a quantum simulation of an open quantum system, but you can use this to create completely new types of uh, security systems, materials, uh, drugs, vaccines, communication system, AI, which are using quantum particles and using their amazing laws and their amazing possibilities like those um, opened up by uh, superposition or entanglement, typical features of quantum physics, in order to, uh, to perform uh, and to break the limits of what is possible uh, to, to compute or to create. I will give just one uh, practical example, uh, and this is the fact that uh, quantum simulators are almost uh, uh, sufficiently big and sufficiently efficient uh, to perform um, uh, models uh, and uh, even synthesize plant, how to synthesize optimized fertilizers. This would cut three to five percent of the world's energy consumption with the corresponding CO2 reduction. A, a, a fertilizers of this type would allow at the same time to tackle three United Nations sustainable, um, sustainable challenges. Um, and, and these are zero hunger, um, sustainable um, development challenges. And these are zero hunger, climate action, and responsible consumption and production. So this, this would allow um, to impact at the level of what are considered the most important problems uh, humanity is facing, as decided also by the United Nations. Um, okay. What do we need uh, in order to, to create uh, this new ecosystem? First of all, I believe that we need the citizens and policymakers that are informed and aware of a technology that is able to revolutionize our society in an unprecedented way. We need to educate a new workforce for the emerging quantum industry, because competencies in quantum are not created overnight, and because there are a number of industries nowadays which are becoming quantum ready, and therefore are requiring, requiring more and more quantum uh, educated um, employees. Uh, I think that at the level really of policymakers, we need a visionary, interdisciplinary and intersectoral plan of actions and resources because we need to nurture this emergent quantum ecosystem. Uh, overall, uh, what, what we need, what I believe passionately, is that we need to rethink how we teach and communicate science. And for this, this is a part in which I can already um, open up to, uh, to the contribution of everyone. The reason is that we have developed an online platform to teach quantum science and technology in a new way. This platform is free for everyone. It's called QPlay. You find it in here there is an address, cuplilearn.com, and it's interesting because it's based on a new philosophy for contributing to science. I want to tell you a little bit more about it. So this is an online platform which contains multimedia resources for learning about quantum science and technology, importantly, in a playful way. Be this is because we believe that the, in the importance of science and education and scientific literacy for our society, so not just for experts, but everyone. And we also believe that anyone can understand some of the principle, at least the beauty or being inspired by the beauty of quantum physics and the power of quantum technologies. So our mission is to provide multi-level education on quantum science and technologies to everyone, regardless of their age and background. So the way in which uh, we believe of the structure QPlay Learn is on the principle that the intelligence is diverse, and therefore the, the way, the logic way of teaching quantum physics is not the only way. So we uh, can uh, we, we have developed a threefold approach uh, that we call the play, discover, and learn. For play, uh, we use intuition and experience, or we try to approach quantum physics by using intuition and experience. For this, we have developed video games, video, and experiences 
which are aimed at teaching or experiencing quantum physics. Then we have the discover where we um, tackle the conceptualization phase where we describe physics. So quantum physics via experiments. And then we have learn that is the more um, formalization, abstraction and mathematics part of QPlay Learn. Very recently, we also uh, la launched in collaboration with Strangeworks, uh, Apply. Uh, apply is a section where you can also uh, learn how to program a quantum computer by a very simple uh, exercises uh, and tutorials. So the idea of QPlay Learn is to build a connection, to, cre to, to create connections between citizens and schools, be between academia and companies. So we, we target uh, schools, high schools, and uh, aimed at engaging the students with online games that introduce the concept of quantum mechanics intuitively. But we also target uh, universities and we uh, propose to enrich uh, the courses on quantum information by using multimedia material that builds intuition and makes students aware of the new quantum technologies. Finally, we also uh, target companies for the retraining in quantum in, and, and uh, explain them how to speed up the learning process uh, by means of an, uh, our innovative approach. Uh, so our approach, as I said, um, is threefold, uh, build intuition and engagement through games, understand the physical concepts through uh, easy to follow yet scientifically accurate description, and also understand and delve in the abstract concept through the math. And you can decide, everyone can decide to which level they want to stop. So maybe there are people who just want to uh, stop at the level of the intuition and engagement through games and videos. There are those who want to go more in depth and understand the physics, and there are those who may want to go even more in depth and understand the mathematical concept. But there can also be people who can decide, or students who can decide that they want to start from the math because they have a more logical way of thinking. And all these, these post paths are allowed. So uh, if you go to QPlay Learn, uh, you will find the quest is a quantum dictionary uh, containing at the moment uh, 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 10 entries. The first one is quantum physics, and then there is quantum states, qubit, quantum superposition, entanglement, tunneling, quantum measurement, wave-like behavior, Heisenberg principle, and quantum technologies. Uh, in all of them, for each of them, you will find, uh, um, for each of the uh, dictionary entries, you will find the video games, you will you find the physics experiment explanations, and you will find the math. And these are examples of small video games that you can find. Psi and Delta is a video game to explain the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics, or the action of measurement, uh, and, um, and, and the wave function um, um, itself, and the probabilities. So you can, they're all free, you can just go there, and, uh, and uh, play uh, and, and experience and learn about quantum physics. Um, coming soon, the new entries, Schrodinger cut, quantum interference, quantum thermodynamics, and Schrodinger equation. And very soon, we will also have online a world course on quantum computing. Now, how can you help? Well, we are very eager uh, to, uh, to have uh, collaborators for QPlay Learn. Anyone can contribute to QPlay Learn. We have at the moment a challenge uh, on developing a game on the Heisenberg principle, because we don't have yet a game on a Heisenberg principle. So everyone is welcome to, to contribute, um, becoming an official collaborator and acknowledged in the web page of QPlay Learn. So just contact us if you want to help us developing uh, quantum physics uh, free for everyone. Um, what we are trying to do is to build a community based on the principles of diversity and inclusiveness, bringing together universities, schools, companies, policymakers, and citizens, because we think this is the best chance we have to learn from nature how to build a sustainable, better future. Now, I, I've been asked also by the organizers to say a bit, of, a few words about my personal quantum journey, what made me become uh, a quantum physics professor, uh, and that's where it began. <laughs> this is a picture of when I was very little in Sicily. I was born, I don't know if you can see it, with one blue eye and one black eye, but then they changed and became of the same uh, color. And I was born in this beautiful island that is uh, Sicily. Um, and then 
when I started to move from Sicily, I went to university in Palermo. From Palermo, uh, I did my first postdoc in Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, then I moved for a uh, um, very short time to Palermo back. And finally, I reached, uh, I, I, I joined the group of uh, Professor Francesco Petrucciano as a, a postdoc in Durban in South Africa. From there, I went back to Bulgaria for a short while until arriving in Turku in Finland, where I got my uh, senior uh, uh, researcher position. Then I got my first professorship in Edinburgh uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And finally, I became a professor of uh, uh, the chair of, um, of uh, uh, theoretical physics uh, in the University of Turku. Now I live in Helsinki, which is the capital of Finland, very close to Turku. I didn't even know where Helsinki was, but this is what, <laughs> what it looks like. This is a picture of me fishing through a hole, a common activity that uh, it is done in winter in uh, uh, in Finland. Uh, well, uh, Finland is a beautiful country. At the moment, it's more like winter like, as you can see on the left hand side. But the summer is beautiful. There is a fantastic archipelago in front of, in front of islands, in front of Turku, where you can go hiking and cycling. And this is how it looks uh, to swim in the Finnish lakes. Finland is the country of the thousand lakes. Now, my group uh, has very recently moved from Turku. So in the past, uh, the past web page of the group was TQT, Turku Quantum Technology .fi. It contains a lot of information about us. The new group is called Heltech in the University of Helsinki. We have a number of PhD students and a number of postdocs. Uh, and uh, our main uh, fields of, of, uh, um, of study are quantum technologies, in particular quantum computing and algorithms, but also we have a field of research on complex quantum networks and emergence in connector, connection with biology, neuroscience and gravity. And of course, open quantum system is my background, uh, is my main field of, uh, um, of, of background. And I think with this, I said everything I wanted to tell you, and I thank you very much. I apologize for the uh, at the beginning if we started a bit late my fault my my, my I, unfortunately i have a mac so it wasn't so smooth i apologize for my mac using i hope this was uh, um, gave you some inspiration at least and i thank you very much for listening okay so uh, thank you ma'am and so uh there's one of our sci members uh, she wants to say something so uh Dibanshi, hello dr sabrina i'm the banshi i'm an mc chemistry student here at ip mandi and a core member of sci team i'll take a few minutes to give my thoughts on this talk and also to express my thanks to you Thank you. I'll begin with some highlights of today's Thank talk, you. which I found quite appealing. Like you mentioned about the idea of nature as the prime teacher. Uh, I can relate very well with your idea and believe that nobody can teach us better than the nature. What we all need is a yes. good perception yeah. to see those learnings. Uh, other one is we have an idea of science that it is usually about mechanical working of the things around us, but your perception of dealing science as something natural is new to the audiences. And moreover, the idea of applying quantum com uh, quantum computing beyond quantum physics and simulations, like using it towards the development of quantum security, development of drugs, protein folding, like in biology, etc. Quite innovative, and we are very well able to relate your goal to create a society ready for quantum revolution. Outside the world of quantum, you've always been interested towards mathematics and physics, which we can see from your personal journey too. Uh, also, in one of your interviews, you revealed that you are fond of exploring the interdisciplinary research areas, which gives us an idea that you are a type of uh, who is interested in multiple technical domains uh, along with science and art. Now talking about you as a person, yes. you are appreciable for your healthy perception towards life. Like in uh, one of your interviews, you have suggested people to laugh a lot, to live a lot, um, and to be passionate <laughs> yes. about whatever one does. Uh, yes. So the outputs for this 
have come to you in the form of achievements which includes the awards you have received like the young scientist award for your contribution in the topic uh, the evolution of single trap dial in a high q optical cavity and the award of the italian national foundation angelo della ricca 2005 for studies in microphysics so a strong understanding of the academic concepts plus a healthy perception towards naturally fetching you a life of achievements, recognition, and hence contentment. I to learn from your journey as a fierce lady in science who knows how to cherish academics as well as life together. Last but not the least, I would like to thank everyone present here to make this event alive even through the online world. So our time, uh, our team I'd love to see you again for another talk in the coming time soon. <laughs> and if possible, hopefully in person with you in our campus. I conclude with a greeting from all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Very nice words. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so uh, I would request the audience if there are any questions uh, you may ask in the chat box or uh, with YouTube. Uh, you may ask on our YouTube the channel uh, where we are. So, is there any questions? Then you may ask. Yes, okay, uh, okay, one of our members have one question. Yes, you can ask that. Uh, hello, Dr. Sabrina. Yes, hi. I'm, I'm, I'm Sahil. I'm a core member at SCI and also I'm a student of master's in structural engineering. Means my uh, domain is from the civil engineering background. So I have one basic question to ask that uh, what are the basic things someone should know before uh, starting to learn about the quantum computation? Like the basic skills one need to know before doing the quantum computations. Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, I would say that linear algebra is uh, would be if you want to. Okay, actually, let me let me um, uh, rephrase it. It depends on what is your goal. So, if you just want to have uh, some ideas of what quantum, quantum computing is about, um, really to to be informed, but not to know in detail the math, because of course, in order to have uh, um, knowledge uh, of quantum physics, uh, you will need uh, um, a certain point to understand the mathematics. But you can just have an idea of what it is about. And for these, I would and really I think that uh, everybody can become familiar with the concept of quantum physics, familiar, not, not expert, but familiar. And for these, again, no previous knowledge, just uh, visit Cupola Learn uh, website. But if you want to become an expert, uh, then I would say that definitely uh, you would need the, the minimum would be uh, some linear algebra course. Uh, and ideally, um, maybe that. Uh, in the university, there might be um, uh, quantum physics courses uh, at the bachelor level. But linear algebra is the, is the mathematical um, requirement uh, for quantum physics, I would say, um, in the in the Dirac formalism, at least, at least a, a way of, of, of uh, already explaining many things like quantum superposition, entanglement. This can be very well explained with Dirac formalism by using uh, um, as mathematical background the linear algebra. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we are developing now uh, online courses that will be freely available uh, that use this different methodology, like the one of uh, on quantum computers, the, like different methodology, because we think we would like to we would like to involve people, not just by PDF files or videos of me uh, talking, but really hands on uh, by playing, uh, but also by uh, making some um, uh, small, uh, um, you know, really learning how to co uh, program a quantum computer through some simple exercises and tutorials. It is possible. So we would like to find the best way of doing this. And we are already trying via the Qplay Learn. And everyone can give us feedback if you want to help us to grow, not just uh, contribute. When I say to contribute, it's not just uh, to do something, although we aim at being a collector, an aggregator of content, uh, but also what I mean is um, even feedback is important. You know, even an email, ah, I tried this, it doesn't work. For example, we do know already 
that QPlay Learn. Uh, in QPlay Learn, we, unfortunately, for if you use uh, Safari as a browser, we have a problem for the games. I'm telling you so that uh, if someone is uh, so, if you use Chrome, is okay. Safari doesn't work. So this type of even even some technical feedback can be useful, but we uh, we aim at really um, reaching uh, a different level, a different level of of education. Uh, people, uh, yes, it was a, sorry, it was a longer answer. I hope uh, it was sufficient. <laughs> And okay, so thank you, thank you, Professor. So uh, actually, I have also one question. Uh, I think that uh, this question might have been asked uh, to you by many. So uh, for the sake of completeness, I will be asking the same. So, so there is a talk of quantum supremacy everywhere. Uh, recently, Google declared uh, quantum supremacy. So I think it's debatable. But still, uh, in near future, we are expecting a quantum supremacy. So, I, uh, my question is that: Is there any chance that uh, quantum computers replace classical ones completely, or they will work yes. in hand? Yes, a very good, a very good question. And uh, actually, it has two questions uh, in itself. I think both the I, I would like to comment on the quantum supremacy, and then to talk about um, uh, what you just said. Uh, and I would like to begin by saying that first of all, one has to make a distinction between uh, universal fault tolerant quantum computers and uh, uh, small scale quantum devices like quantum simulators. I've been when I talk about learning from nature how to simulate nature, I have in mind automatically uh, quantum simulators simulators, obviously, um, rather than universal quantum devices necessarily. But OK, they are, they, both of them are, exist. Obviously, both of them would be useful. Uh, uh, um, but the problem is that for fault tolerant and universal quantum computers, um, like really big scale quantum computers, we, we, we really we are very far from building them. We don't know, actually. Th there are some major roadblocks, including exactly the coherence and noise that need to be um, overcome. Uh, so there are some fundamental uh, open problems that need to be overcome in order to achieve uh, real scale, uh, big scale, uh, fault tolerant quantum computers. In any case, even if in 10, maybe 20 years, we would, we would arrive there, they would not replace completely classical computers because uh, really uh, the modalities, first of all, because uh, the way, so, so obviously computers, run using uh, algorithms software that is based on algorithms and the algorithms uh, that are used in quantum computers are really fundamentally different compared to the classical algorithms so they are different types and there aren't uh, you know so they are not there aren't quantum algorithms for solving any problem <laughs> that the uh, classical algorithm can solve so we do have some quantum algorithms where we can prove actually the usefulness of, of quantum uh, particles and quantum laws, uh, but um, for many others, we will still continue to run classical computers. So uh, even for full tolerant long term um, quantum computers, we will have most likely hybrid uh, systems so, so that contain both classical uh, software and, and, and the computer and some quantum core to solve certain problems for which there is need uh, of, of quantum inside. But let's say that then there is the other category, which is the small scale quantum devices, NIST devices. Um, they are the noisy, uh, small 50 qubits quantum computers that we have now, that Google has, uh, that IBM has, that Microsoft has, that D-Wave has. Now, for these small devices, then uh, there has been the claim, of course, uh, of uh, Google to have reached quantum advantage, which is, uh, of course, uh, is correct. But the, the question is uh, uh, whether we have, whether we can prove, so really, the, I would say the uh, holy grail really is of, of the uh, quantum computer would be to prove quantum advantage for a useful problem. So what, what has been done is uh, to prove in quantum advantage uh, for a proof of principle of, of a, for a problem which actually isn't useful to, for anything, right? But we would like to do it for something which is useful. That's why I was referring, for example, to the simulation of uh, um, penicillin, like, like some um, small, small drugs, or it could be uh, for creating new fertilizers, 
uh, because really th this would be already some use cases that have potential dramatic impact in our society. And we are almost there. For this, I really truly believe um, that it might be the question of a couple of years, maybe three, maybe five. So we are almost there because the, 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 you, you do not require uh, really uh, millions of qubits, but rather um, it's, it's of, of the level of hundreds would be sufficient, really, uh, with a sufficient quality. Yes. Uh, professor, uh, so uh, we will wait for one or two minutes. If anyone has any question, then uh, they may post it in uh, chat box or they may comment on uh, our YouTube channel. I have one more question. Okay. Sure. Hello, hello, hello ma'am. I, I have one more question to ask. Uh, actually, I'm quite appealed by your idea of moving in sync with the nature when it comes about learning. Like you said, you meant to say say that. When we are using technology, if we will keep the technology moving with the nature, in sync with them, that will be very productive. So, so I sorry. have one question to ask. I, sorry, I'm sorry. There was, sorry, there was a cut in the internet. I didn't. Can you repeat it again? I didn't hear because the internet uh, connection wasn't uh, okay, okay. was jumping. Yes. Okay. Uh, I actually uh, I said that I'm quite appealed. In sync nature. What I got from your uh, presentation was that that you meant to say that if we keep the technology moving in sync with the nature, then the output would be quite productive. Yes. So uh, I have one uh, yes. uh, one thing one thing uh, I, I need to ask that we can see nowadays that the issue of climate change is quite alarming nowadays. So this is also a call from mm -hmm. the nature, like we see in the form of the. Uh, forces of the nature getting intensifying, like the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the cloud bursts. So I'm curious to know that uh, have you ever thought of using quantum computing to solve the issue of the climate change, or can it be yes. thought in this direction? So what are your comments about it? Yes, yes, this is a very good question, and uh, there are people who are uh, trying already now to see what concretely could be done by using quantum computers. But actually, one of the examples that I uh, showed before, the one of these fertilizers, um, uh, I was saying that uh, if you could uh, uh, realize these optimized fertilizers, uh, then this would cut three to five percent of the world's energy consumption. And this obviously means implies also with the corresponding uh, CO2 uh, emissions reduction. So if you would need to consume much less uh, energy, much less, it's already five percent, but it's still a lot, then this would automatically improve uh, the, um, the situation. Uh, in the uh, from the perspective of uh, um, CO2 emissions, uh, with the consequence, of course, of uh, of um, uh, acting uh, towards um, climate uh, climate uh, action. So I, I think, in general, uh, this is one example, and there may be many. I will just um, say that one of the biggest challenges now is to find ways concretely. Uh, to um, to to use this quantum advantage for relevant use cases and certainly for climate uh, action is one of one of them mm -hmm. uh, yes professor uh, i think we have one more question on our chat box uh, so i would be dictating that to you so uh, the question goes: uh, Will quantum computing be useful for biology, bio slash biotechnology, for the treatment and for making structures of drugs for the diseases which are not curable till now, like cancer? Yes, uh, the the short answer is uh, yes. Um, the there is a field that is quantum biology, which is describing uh, the uh, quantum effects in biological systems. But also, um, for example, we, we, I, I'm also co-founder and CEO of a, a company, Algorithmic, uh, in which we exactly study um, how to use uh, small short term quantum devices um, to impact uh, the life sciences, uh, and in particular, one of the greatest framework is precisely uh, in uh, in um, in drug development. So uh, the answer is definitely yes. Um, how and in which way? It's really a very hot topic um, question, 
uh, and where everyone is, is, is trying to, to give a proper answer already to be able to identify a very clear case in which this can be done. There are a lot of suggestions on how and what, but a very clear case in which this would be done would be a, a great, um, a great achievement. Thank you, Professor. And uh, we got one more question from uh, student. He says that what are the limitations of quantum computing? Yes, so the limitations of quantum, the first limitation, there are different categories of limitation. The very first one uh, is uh, uh, something that I already mentioned before, uh, that is the fact that, um, well, not all uh, computational problems uh, have the characteristics to be amenable uh, to uh, be speed up <laughs> uh, by um, uh, quantum computers. So in some cases, well, we don't have quantum algorithms uh, which show advantage uh, for certain problems. So there's a question of um, actually improving and increasing the number of uh, uh, algorithms that might be um, showing, uh, let's say, quantum advantage. So this is an open uh, field of research, is really quantum algorithms and software. Uh, then there is another um, another uh, obvious uh, limitation that is a technical limitation, but it could also be foundational. This is related to the fact that current devices are very, very noisy. Now, uh, the effect uh, of, of noise induced by the environment, the fact that these, these quantum particles that are really carrier of information uh, are also um, subjected to interaction with everything which surrounds them uh, causes noise, uh, which creates errors. Uh, and uh, this uh, causes a phenomenon that is known as quantum decoherence that limits the life, let's say, let's call it the quantum life uh, of, of the uh, quantum computers. So uh, quantumness uh, in, inside the real quantum devices doesn't last very long. And this means that you don't have the time to perform many gates and don't have the time to make long circuits. And therefore you lose quantum advantage uh, rather quickly at the moment. So there are a number of ways in which you can tackle this, this, this problem and try to improve it and announce it. Uh, and different approaches that are investigated from topological quantum computing to error corrections uh, strategy, quantum error correction strategies and many other things. But there is not yet a, a winning, uh, let's say, solution for the large uh, long-term uh, fault tolerant quantum computation. It's still a lot needs to be done. So noise is definitely something which still affects uh, too much uh, the operation of uh, quantum computers and it transforms them from quantum to classical very quickly. Um, yes. Okay, so thank you, Professor. I, I think uh, Saurav and uh, Shumanshu, your answers are, uh, basically your questions are answered right now. So uh, it seems that uh, there are no questions uh, on board. So I think it's time to end the video. Very thank nice. You. Thank you, Professor, for your. So uh, you very uh, yeah. Yes, you, you are. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, thank you very much. I wanted to thank again. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, I, I don't hear you very well because uh, there are some interruptions in the internet connection. I'm sorry. So. Uh, no problem, no problem. So, uh, thanks again. So, okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.